Okay. What should we study today? <clears throat> uh, no takers? Then let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Fifth chapter today. <laughs> Moving right along. Remember I had told you some time back that it's in that fifth chapter that the, uh, the glee starts coming out of the ugly. This is where things uh, start to get a little dicey, a little dirty, a little, uh, a little deep in regards to the Corinthian sin problem. I think it's going to be important as we get into the teaching today that you are reminded that the Corinthians, as best as we can tell, and I'd say it's pretty much for sure, didn't have elders. They did not have pastoral oversight, which is one of the reasons why they're dealing with some of the sins that they're dealing with. And what is so incredible about it, as we get into the fifth chapter, remember I mentioned this to you last week, Paul is not so much addressing the uh, sinful couple or the sinful young man in this case that's involved in this uh, fornicative situation with uh, what appears to be stepmom, but he's rebuking the congregation for their lack of action. And he's basically taking them by the nose from a distance. And he's saying, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to do it now. And he's going to take them through steps that will result in the excommunication of this one church member with the, uh, with the focus and goal being this person's reconstitution back into Christ and the local body right there through his repentance. And, and if, uh, if Paul is speaking to this same situation, then by the time you get over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3, 2 in particular, he does speak about the Corinthians need to now receive back the one sinning individual uh, that had been cut, cast out from their midst. Uh, we don't want to burden him with over much sorrow, but apparently this person had repented. Now he has to tell them to receive him back. And so this may be the same uh, young man that is about to be, as Paul is going to say, uh, delivered over unto Satan. What is that? Well, most of you probably already know that's a biblical term of excommunication. But we're going to talk about the implications and why Paul used that phrase. Why didn't he just say, cast him out of the church? Well, he's going to say that when you get down into verse 13, for instance. He will say something along those lines. But why does he say that in particular? Why bring that name up in regards to this scenario where the young man, you know, is a recognized believer, a member of the church, but is unrepentant over this sin, and now this extreme step needs to be taken. As you can see from the title of the teaching today, this is Dealing with Unrepentant Sin in the Congregation, Part 2, because I actually started this last week. Dealing with Unrepentant Sin, it, it was the subtitle of last week's teaching, and now, today, it's the main title. And so we are in Chapter 5. Verses 1 through 5, let's read it together. It is actually reported that there is immorality, porneia, among you, <clears throat> and an immorality of such a kind as does not even exist among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. And you have become arrogant, and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of the Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Boy, that's like, uh, that's like a real slap in the face right there, isn't it? I mean, I'll wake you up right now. Better than the strongest cup of coffee. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's kind of sudden. It's very abrupt. It's Paul's like, notice what he doesn't say. Um, you know, he doesn't say, bottom of verse 2, so that the one who has done this need might be encouraged to stop it because this is not good. Paul goes just right for the jugular. I wonder why he does that. Why does he say, no, when you're gathered together, my, my spirit is present, I'll talk about that. Deliver this one over unto Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Can you imagine that? 
We'll put that in the church bulletin next week. This uh, next uh, Thursday, we'll be delivering uh, Mr. Jones over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. And uh, y'all come, there'll be a potluck afterwards. <laughs> you know, it's shocking. You just don't, you don't hear about this too much, you know. And one of the reasons that the nation is in the condition that it's in is because you don't hear about this too much because it isn't going on enough. Instead, what we get on TV is what we heard about this situation at that church and that pastor is going out with the church secretary or having sex with the people that he counsels in, the, in private and this sort of a thing. And oh yeah, it's happening in the choir. And oh yeah, you know, P PCUSA, you know, we're not only going to uh, allow homosexuals to become members and recognize them as just, you know, a different part of God's creation, but we're going to ordain those men and women who are homosexual. And you wonder why the judgment of God is on this nation right now. It's dealing with the failure to deal with unrepentant sin in the congregation. Look at your outline. You're going to see that there are three ways in which we deal with sin in the congregation. First, it's dealing with sin according to the facts. And this is true uh, for, uh, for any pastor or any lay person, just the average Believer, and I don't mean to make it sound, you know, the average believer, you're more than that, but the average believer in the pew. You know, you got to get your facts together before you know if you uh, are to deal with something or if it even is sin. You know, we're not talking about jumping the gun here. We're not talking about something that looks a little salacious or looks a little sideways funny. We're talking about something that is on the table, that is known, that is more than just some sort of, you know, interchurch gossip sort of a thing, but facts have to be discovered. See, in Deuteronomy, uh, the 18th chapter, it talks about the fact that uh, there are some cities out there, God says through Moses, where there is gross idolatry going on and that you are to do your due diligence and you are to check on these things and do your surveying and make sure that your detective work is accurate to find out if, in fact, blasphemy against me has been going on. And then if so, then you take certain actions, which will result in the ban that would be on that city. You know, God is about the facts and about doing, do, dealing with things correctly. Secondly, when we look at verse 3, we'll be dealing with sin by making a judgment. And this is where it starts to make, you know, people get their ire up and that kind of a thing. And I don't want to be around a bunch of people that are going to bring judgment on. Well, you know, 1 Corinthians is all about Paul making a judgment on these people based upon what he's told based upon the infor, infor, information that the Holy Spirit has given him, which then leads to the third and final point, and here's where it gets really uncomfortable for most people in the pews, dealing with sin by involving the congregation. He's going to involve the entire congregation in what he calls this delivering of this person over to Satan. The church does it en masse. Same thing would be true in regards to the Old Testament law, uh, when a capital crime had been committed, witchcraft, adultery, murder, something along those lines, it said that in Deuteronomy 17 and Deuteronomy 19, that there has to be two or more witnesses in order to substantiate a charge, because the witnesses are saying, I'm staking my life on the truth and veracity of what I am witnessing to, and the witnesses are to be the first to be casting that stone. That's what Jesus was referring to, which is taken out of context an awful lot. You know, which one among you, John chapter 8, is going to cast the first stone? Jesus was asking for witnesses in regards to the accusations that they were bringing about this woman supposedly caught in the very act of adultery, you see. Well, when the congregation here delivers this one over to Satan, we are saying as one, and by the way, after the first two witnesses would throw the stone, then the rest of the congregation would throw the stones. It would be over rather quick, by the way. People think about stoning, you know, done in a, in a mosaic uh, stricture, and they think, oh my gosh, how incredibly cool, cruel. Actually, it would have been more like, you know, having a giant floor of cement suddenly dropped on you, and it would be over with pretty fast. But still, it's vicious, and it's supposed to be that way because it's amplifying sin to us. So the entire congregation, after they've had the facts... And they take Paul's steps, and there are, there are four steps I'm going to point out to you, Then together, once that has been established, the whole congregation gets behind it, and the man is excommunicated. Wow, what's supposed to happen with that? Then what happens? Well, that's what we're studying here. The purpose of this study today is to not only inform you, but this is preventative. This kind of information keeps this type of behavior, sinful behavior, 
from grabbing hold of a congregation and taking place in your life. And I guarantee you, if you're hiding something from the Lord, you've got a little personal sin that's going on, a little personal sin life that's happening. I'm telling you, you're going to be outed. God's going to tell on you. He will. It will come up. Be sure that your sins will find you out. And I say that to myself right into the mirror. Nobody gets to hide. Let's consider verses 1 through 2, dealing with sin according to the facts, where Paul says in verse 1, it is actually reported that there is porneia among you. Now, we touched on this briefly last week. When he says it is actually reported, and when he says actually, it's like, I can't believe this. Uh, this is actually taking place. It's olos in Greek. Uh, Paul is a little taken back. Not only is he taken back like this, but he says it's actually reported. Uh, that's a kuatai, which means to receive a report or, or news that gets around. It's public news. Peter sa Paul is saying, I'm actually hearing this from other churches and other places. And the implication is even some unbelievers are aware of, of this situation. Paul is aghast at this, that there is porneia among you. Now, notice I use the Greek word right there instead of immorality. I disagree with the New American Standard. Well, what else is new? I disagree with the way they've decided to translate this right there. I like the word fornication because it's an offensive, direct, biting, barbed word, and I think we need to retain it. Immorality, that's way too general. Lots of things are immoral or without moral, you know. Uh, Let's get down to what Paul's actually talking about here. In the context, you already tell, this is not porneia in the sense of unfaithfulness. This is porneia in the sense of a sexual activity that is taking place outside of the confines of biblical marriage. And he says that there is this porneia that is actually being reported that is among you. Now the you there is the plural form. All of you. Now, what Paul means by this is, even though the one young man is having a sexual salacious relationship with his stepmom, we'll get into that a little bit more, <clears throat> even though he's the one that's perpetrating it, because the congregation knows that it's going on and is doing nothing about it, then what? Yeah, exactly. They're all implicated as being just as guilty of the sin because by not doing anything about it, they're promoting it and allowing it to take place inside of that congregation, which is contrary to who Christ has saved. Christ saved his bride, the church, by the blood of his cross made pure and clean and holy and acceptable. And then this activity is going on amongst the... See, the, the ongoing sin thing you know, is contradictory to who Christ has saved you to be. To who Christ has saved you to be. It's back to front and all that kind of a thing. And so Paul is outraged. It's actually, and he's not letting anybody off the hook, is he? If, one is, if sin is going on in one uh, uh, congregant's life and other folks in the congregation know about it and they're not doing anything about it, they're not going to that brother or sister, Man, you know, just tell me, I've just heard this, or I, I think I've seen this. I'm willing to be wrong, you know, but here's what I've seen. And you just go to them, and this is what I was heard, and this is what I've witnessed. And you go to them, is, is that true? Just be honest with me, you know. And if they say, well, yeah, it is, then it's your job to say, and, and you do recognize that this is sin, yes. Lead them down that trail. And then you go with that. I mean, if they're going to say no, I, I, just, I really don't think it, it is, then you be ready with Scripture in regards to that. You don't come with your own thing. Well, if you get nowhere with that person, member or not, if they're here, member or not, you come to Tony, Keith, or me. And then the three of us will deal with it. But it cannot be allowed to stay. And I, it will not be allowed to stay. Everybody sins. I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that's ongoing, whether it's private or public. And I'm going to talk to you about the difference between private and public sins. In fact, I, I better touch on it right now. Uh, private sins are something where there is no witness to it. It's just you and the Lord. He's the witness, you know, and you've sinned this sin, as is biblically defined. 
And uh, that is dealt with privately. Individuals are not made a public example of when they've got a private problem and there are no witnesses to it. With me? But when there is public sin, that's where the sin has been made public and there are now witnesses that this is going on. See, this is why when I was back in the when I was in the PCA so many years ago that I was completely aghast and made my my uh, my uh, uh, incenseness, I suppose, known to the clerk of the presbytery and to other members of the presbytery that when I found out that they that there was a young man who was an associate pastor within the PCA and he had um, a, a private sinful problem. And it was not a public sin. It was made known by accident, if you will, to the senior pastor who then, instead of dealing with it in-house between going to that young associate pastor and dealing what he knew to be true, which then the associate pastor admitted to, instead he then took that to another member of the board or something like that, which then it got taken to the clerk of the presbytery, which then it was made public and brought to all of the men, all of us guys, at the presbytery, and he was just completely outed about it. And I listened to everything that went down, and I determined this should have never taken place in a public venue. This was private from the beginning. I'm not saying it was any less sin and didn't need to be repented of and cleansed by the blood of Christ, but it didn't need to be made public. Now, that young man and his reputation, guess what? His ministry, over. At least in the PCA. Now he's black sheep. Now every time you look at that guy or hear his name, what are you going to think about? You're going to think about the sin, and I'm not even naming the sin before you, but you're going to think about the sin that was named publicly. And I, after that thing was over with, I went directly to the clerk of the presbytery. He was a mean old guy. <laughs> anyway, went right to him in the foyer of where we were meeting, and I said, I just want you to know I absolutely disagree with, with this entire procedure, because my understanding of scriptures, and I basically told him what I just told you, this was a private sin. It should never have been made public. It should never have gone to this point, you know, in front. And then I went to the young man, you know, and he's like, just, what's he got? He's just, he just He's just submitting and he's humbling himself and he's gone through this whole process, you know, kind of a thing. And he's just out, you know, kind of a thing. And I went to him and I said, that should have never been. It shouldn't have happened that way. Which, you know, he kind of like went, he had to think about that for a little bit. I said, you know, and now I'm finding my, see, why can't I stay in a denomination? Gee, I wonder. You know, and, and it's like other people looking at me, like, hey, uh, this was already decided. This was crap. This was sin. And I came this close to saying, and you all are in sin because of the way you handle this anti-scripturally like that. Oh, well, victory in Jesus. Yeah. He says, there is such an immorality among you, an immorality or a pornea of such a kind as does not even exist among the nations. It's of such a nature that it doesn't even exist among the nations. Now, please make sure that we take a quick look at chapter 6, verses 9 through 11 before we go any further. Lest you think that I'm talking about some unpardonable sin, it's bad, it's sin, if left unrepented, the cancer of sin and the disease therein will eat through your spiritual life, no question about it, and it will result in temporal judgments. Uh, but if you look at 6.9, I want us to understand something about all sin, including pornea. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Who's the unrighteous? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators. How come pornea, in the plural, is translated in the New American Standard as a fornicator here, but it's an immorality in verse 1 of chapter 5? I don't like that. I don't like that. Let's be consistent here. Do not be deceived. Otherwise, they would have had to say, do not be deceived, neither immorals or immoralers or something like that. That must be what well, we're going to have to shoot. We're just going to have to use the word fornication here. Okay. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, no malakoi. Malakoi is the feminine form of the male homosexual who receives the other male's sexual organ into their body. Yuck, I know, sorry, but that's the Greek. Nor homosexuals, that's arsenokoitai, arson, 
the prefix has to do with a male animal. Koitai means to have sex. This is the male who is performing uh, as the male to another male in the homosexual act, which said other male is playing the woman, uh, the part. Okay? We won't go any further than that. But the very word arson right there is the word for a male animal in many cases, and that's the same word that Paul uses in Romans, the first chapter. Disgusting, isn't it? Disgusting. Everybody say yuck. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God and you're all going to hell. No, verse 11 says, and such were some of you. Isn't that fabulous? These Corinthians were those homosexual offenders. They were those fornicators. They were those drunkards. They are guilty, guilty, guilty. And such were, past tense, some of you. But, verse 11, you were washed you were sanctified, made holy. You were justified, acquitted of the charges against you in the name, authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and then the Spirit of our God. I wanted us just to read that so you understand that there is cleansing, there is right positioning, there is the forgetting of what is behind and reaching towards what is before. There is the Micah 719 that all your sins are cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness. There is that for these Corinthians. And guess what? In chapter 5, which we're back at now, there is that for this young man. There is that. There is cleansing. There is reinstatement. But Paul is wanting to make the point clear that this type of verse 1, fornication, doesn't even exist among the nations. And he means those who don't know God, who are out of covenant with God. That's why, what he means by the word Gentiles or nations. The ethnots, ethnots, people who are in abject darkness that don't have the light of the truth of God's word. They don't even do this kind of sin. And it's going on in your church, and I've had to hear about it from other people. It's getting around. Think their witness was a little bit shot? That's the least of their problems. And then he brings it out. Bottom of verse 1. Doesn't even exist among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife. Someone has his father's wife. Now he doesn't say somebody is having a sexual relationship with his mother. He's saying somebody has his father's wife. By the way, the word has right there in the Greek is a present tense form of the verb. It didn't just happen once. It's an ongoing, regular activity. They're living together, jacked up, as it were, and are in this illicit relationship. Now, once again, I pointed out to you last week, Yeah, we don't know what happened to Dad. Dad is either divorced from this woman, and this is this young man's stepmother. His real mother is, is out of the picture. He's either divorced from the mom, or mom has died, or... Uh, Mom is gone, and now he has remarried, and now either he has died, and he's out of the picture, or what? He has divorced her, and now he's out of the picture. In, every, in, in any case, it's still illicit, whether she's legitimately uh, divorced from this man or not. If he's dead, well, clearly the covenant is broken. It's still illegitimate. You know why? Because Leviticus 18 and verse 8 is direct and to the point. Leviticus 18, in fact, I want to read verse 7 to you. Leviticus 18, 7 and 8. It says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, that is, the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You are not to uncover her nakedness. Now notice he uses the word mother in verse 7. Then in verse 8 of Leviticus 18, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. So there's a direct commandment. Please understand that verse 8 is talking about not necessarily mom, but the woman that your father is married to. Not, in other words, could be mom, could be a stepmom. So the phrase don't uncover the nakedness means you don't have sexual relationships with them. And no, it doesn't mean you get married to that person. Suddenly that makes it okay and now you can have a sexual relationship. No, it doesn't mean that. You look at chapter 20 and verse 11 of Leviticus, chapter 20 and verse 11, it says, if there is a man who lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness, both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. That's Leviticus 20, 11. 
Now, even though we don't put people to death because we're not under the Mosaic standards, the standards remain as the holy position of God on all things that it speaks to. And this is the level of earthly punishment that gets put upon people that engage in this sort of thing. You know, you think that people are getting away with it? If, if people, God will just take them out. What do you think happened with Ananias and Sapphira? Well, they just lied. We mean just lied. They lied to the Holy Spirit. Careful. They lied to the Holy Spirit, and they did it publicly. See? So God took a public response and took a public stand as to their public lie. Goodness gracious. Back to 1 Corinthians 5. He says further on, Oh, by the way, I'm, I need to, to let you know that this is considered uh, incest in the eyes of the Roman law. This activity that was going on with the Corinthian young man and his stepmom, and it was illegal for them to carry on like this. So not only were they breaking God's law, they were also breaking man's law. A little jail time and who knows what else was awaiting this young guy. And it would come right back onto the church, onto the local assembly, if they didn't do something about it. Now look at verse 2. He now directs his comments to the church. All of you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead. What do you mean arrogant? Their arrogance is not so much in the puffed up sort of a thing. Their arrogance is in the fact that they were taking no steps to deal with this internally. All it just makes us uncomfortable. Well, I don't think we should stick our nose in their business, you know. Well, we can't just tell them that you can't come to church anymore. I mean, that's not exactly Christian love, is it? I mean, we're supposed to be open and accepting of everybody. Go join the flippin' PCUSA. They're going into the tornado of hell as we speak. You might as well join them. He says, you have become arrogant and have not mourned. Their arrogance was the fact that they didn't mourn, which said mourning would have resulted in an excommunication. That's exactly what the context says. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that, it's in other words a result clause, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. Actually, the Greek should be better translated would have been removed from your midst because the word there removed is airo and it's in the aorist, uh, aorist uh, tense. So it's uh, simple English past in this case. The person should have already been removed. By the time the Corinthians received this letter, Paul is, is slapping them around going, this should have already been handled before you got this letter from me. This is how deadly serious this is. By the way, the word iro here, removed, is, is absolutely fine. Uh, it can also mean to, to take away or lift up, lift away, you know. Um, it's the same word where in, in uh, John 17, verse 15, Jesus is praying his prayer before he goes to the cross. And he prays for us and he says, Father, I pray that you will not... Uh, uh, that you will not take them out of the world, but that you will, you know, be with them, cover them, protect them. It's the same word right there, Iro. Interesting, huh? When he says remove, he means get them out. Lift them up and out of the place. This is the, this is the mourning that he's talking about. I take your pencil and I go from the word mourning down to the word remove. Put your arrow down to the word removed. Because that's what he means by this mourning right here. Remove this person, he says, from your midst. Uh, that's excommunication. Remove them from your midst. All right. So when we deal with unrepentant sin in the congregation, we're dealing with sin according to the facts. Fact number one, verse one. It is news that has gotten around that, as a matter of fact, it's public, and it has a basis in truth that there is a porneos among all of you. Fact number one. Well, that's true. That's true. Not only is the young man guilty, but the church is guilty by not doing anything about it. And so the implication is that you're just as guilty as the one doing it. Because you're allowing it to take place. And you're not taking steps. It's such a kind that doesn't even exist among the nations. That's, that's a third fact. Someone has his father's wife. That's a fourth fact. Verse 2, you've become arrogant. That's a fifth fact. Have not mourned instead that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. That's a sixth fact. They have taken no steps whatsoever. 
So that brings us to the second point, dealing with sin by making a judgment. Paul takes the step, verse 3. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. Now, when he says at the top of three that uh, he is absent in body, but present in spirit, I'm sure all of you understand that we're not talking some you know, weird astral projection -y sort of nonsense here. He's not saying that my spirit actually floats around and I'm there with you in the congregation and uh, I'm present in spirit. When he talks about present in spirit, he's, he's talking about I've made my mind known to you. Just like he did over in uh, 1 Corinthians 2 uh, verses 12 and following when he talks about the mind which is equivalent to the thought life at which is the spirit, which is your spirit. Right? He's, all he means right here is that I'm in agreement with this, so this is the action that you're going to take. I don't have to be physically present, but you know my mind on this scenario right here. At least I'm making it clear to you right now. And he wants them to know, middle of verse 3, that I've already judged him who has committed this. Now Paul's at a distance, but what's he got here? He's got an assembly of the facts an assemblage of the facts as he has put them together. What else does he have? Well, he's got the fact that he's an apostle and he has that authority and the requisite spiritual, supernatural gifts that come with that. Thirdly, he's got the Holy Spirit who he's under the inspiration of right now as he writes this. And like it says in, in 1 Peter 1, that uh, when men are inspired, they are carried along by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is carrying him along right now in regards to this. So, yeah, Paul can make this judgment. who has so committed this as though I were present, he says. You see, here's the thing. You know, we just, we just don't want to get involved. If you're a believer, you're involved. As, even if this is a, a situation where this person is not a part of your church, you know, you have a choice right there. You can say, wait a minute, don't tell me anymore. Let's leave it right there, you know, with that. But if the information keeps coming at you like it tends to come at me, from different points, north, east, west, and south here around our, our country. See, there's a lot of preterists out there who are uh, not churched. Um, and uh, I'm not talking about those who are in rebellion against the word. I'm talking about folks that genuinely, you know, do not have a clear conscience in staying where they were and they felt like they needed to, to step out because of their convictions. And I, I, for the most part, the ones I know about, I support them in regards to that. You know, but then we've got things going on uh, out there and they have to talk to somebody, you know. So I throw myself onto the road in front of the oncoming truck and here we go, you know. Sometimes I bring it to you, but usually I try to get it settled, you know, in, in another way. Now I don't claim to have any authority over them and I tell them that. You know, you're not a part of Messiah, you're not a member of my church. You know, it's, it's like really, I mean, we love David and, and Lynn Brown, you know, but I can't really exercise authority over there because it's, out, it's another locale. They're not local here. They're not members in, in that sense. They don't submit themselves. Submitting themselves to me is not enough. They have to submit themselves to the other elders and they have to submit themselves to you. That's, that's membership. And then, and then we reciprocate back to them. So I don't recognize any authority until that happens. But once that happens, then they have the benefit of having that authority and I can speak to it and the other elders can speak to their scenario and so on and so forth. But here's this situation now where Paul makes a judgment as an apostle and he doesn't mind saying that. I have already judged him. You know, he has to judge them because who else is doing it? The Corinthians are doing it. They're not taking any steps. They're letting it go on. She judge him. Look at verse 7. Put another way, he says, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. What does clean out the old leaven mean? Well, he's reaching back into the Old Testament mosaic ritual in regards to getting ready for Passover. You know, and you take the little feather and you get down and into the detailed corners of everything and make sure everything is out of the house. All No, no leaven, no yeast anywhere because it's a you know, symbol of sin. So it's not in my house, you know, kind of. A, so he's using that same format. Clean out the old leaven. What does that mean? It means to do what he just said earlier in verse 4 and 5. Hand that person over to Satan. Excommunication. Shoot. Look at verses 12 and 13. 
He says, what have I, Paul says, what have I to do with judging outsiders, meaning those who are outside the church? What's his implied, uh, the implied response to that? What do I have to do with judging outsiders? What's the implied response to that? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. Right. We don't judge people outside of the church, but as soon as you name the name of Christ, you say you're a Christian and you're maintaining some sort of a, I mean, it's easy. You know, when it's out front like that, you're maintaining some sort of ongoing, you know, sin in your life. I, I'm there to do this. Now, the actual authority to do something about it is another matter. You have to be in this church. He says, what have I to do with judging outsiders? Verse 12, do you not judge those who are within the church? What's the implied answer? Say, heck yes. Yeah. Why? Because the purity and peace of what Christ has purchased with his own blood is what is at stake. Not your comfort zone. Well, I don't want to get into that guy's business. That girl's business makes me uncomfortable. What do you mean trial? Yeah, trial. This is what he's calling them to. He's calling them to a trial. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And then look at 13. But those who are outside, God judges. Now watch what he does. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. And he's pulling that out of Deuteronomy 17, 7, and, and 12. Deuteronomy 17, 7, and 12. As well as some other places. Wow. Remove that wicked. Not... Take that guy aside and work with him and counsel him and try to help him out, you know, and, you know, take him out for lunch. You know. No! Hand him over to the devil. Get him out because he's corrupt and he's going to corrupt you. When the, you know the, the illustration, when the doctor says, man, you know, uh, we got to go in, we got to get that cancer out, you know, but today is, you know, two for Tuesday, so... You know, I, I got to do two of these operations and I don't have time to get all the cancer out. So let me just get out what I can and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. No, you got to get it all out. It's all got to go. This stuff spreads like crazy. I am so, so jealous and zealous uh, about this issue. Not jumping on people, but Preventative medicine maintaining the purity and peace of Messiah Reformed Church. That's, that's it. That's it. And it's like totally focused on, on that. And, and we don't have this problem. We never have had this kind of a problem. Why? Because it's like the, the scripture is honored and preached and detailed and you're being watched and oversight is taking place. And when I see the ugly head of that thing rise up, you know, then I take the appropriate steps to deal with it. If it's private and I don't know about it, well, eventually, I've had God out some people to me, you know, before. <laughs> uh, yeah, it just gets known, you know. But in the meantime, we do the preventative work right here so that this doesn't take place, so that the blessing of God is a constant open, you know, open funnel and all of his blessing keeps pouring through so you can continue to move forward, and the church body can stay healthy. People say to me, how's the church doing? I said, they're doing great. Man, they're healthy and everything like that. Yeah, as far as I know, you know, and I know a bit. He said, well, that's great. Yeah, they want me to say, oh, yeah, we're growing. We had 5,000 people last Sunday. We couldn't fill, fill the building. Didn't have any chairs, you know. What? I don't, I don't see that at all. I mean, the Lord builds the church, and guess what? The Lord builds the church relative to the individuals that are a part of the local church body. That's my concern. you got to deal with sin by making a judgment. Paul calls them to make a judgment. And I've talked to you about that before. I don't feel the need to, to pounce on that really too long. So let's just move on to the third point. Finally, dealing with sin by involving the congregation. Oh, great. Oh, here we go. Do I have to be involved with this? <laughs> if you're a member, you do. And if you're not a member, it's time to be a member. Right? Can I get an amen? amen. Okay. <laughs> you know, i got to stick that in there. Verse 4. Now, these are four steps, by the way, that he gives in verse 4 that are to be taken. Number one, he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
when, two, number two, you are assembled, and number three, I with you in spirit, and number four, with the power of our Lord Jesus. Those are things that have to take place if a true uh, handing over to Satan or excommunication is going to be, is going to, uh, be done. Notice, first of all, that the first thing that needs to happen, and by the way, it's the congregation that does this. You see in the second point where it says, when you are assembled, middle of verse 4, you see that? When you are assembled. Okay, we'll get to that in just a second. First thing is, in the name of our Lord Jesus. That's the authority. When you see name, nomos, that means the authority of. This is not done in my authority. Something this extreme when a person is clearly unrepentant and they just won't budge or they're equivocating and they just don't see it. They do see it, by the way. By the way, they do see it. They just don't like it. They are guilty and they know it. They feel it. Whether they understand the scripture or not, they do know it. So this thing has to be done in the authority of Christ. That's right. You're about to hand somebody over to the devil and it's by the authority of Christ. Because Christ, now this is of course written pre-80-70, can this be done even though Satan is in the lake? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, no hindrance in regards to that whatsoever. No biblical you know, walls put up or anything like that. Not at all. But, but he is the authority over the devil. So just like in the book of Job, he did what, what Christ said in the book of Job. He has to, you know. <laughs> Jesus says to Peter, you know, before he goes to the cross, he says, wow, Satan has asked to receive you so that he can shift, sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your strength doesn't fail. He had to ask, just like I took you over to, you know, the so-called wilderness temptation, Matthew 4, Luke 4. That was not Satan beating up, jumping on a weak Jesus or something like that. That was Jesus, you know, pouncing on the devil, letting him know, letting him know, but as the ministry started, as the three and a half year ministry started, this is how it's going to be, and it's bang, 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 and he just hit him hard three times. Satan had to go away looking for an opportune time because he failed in the wilderness. He failed. He failed to bring him, to get him killed when he was in the womb. He failed to get him killed after he was born. He failed, he failed, he failed, he failed. And he continued to fail. That's why Satan was acting so nuts and crazy. Because, you know, he is. Nuts and crazy in regards to, uh, uh, here's this situation where, where he, 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 he certainly is aware of the Old Testament text about how Jesus, you know, would going to be, you know, crucified. And that he's going and he's possessing Judas and he's trying to make the arrangements and get him on that cross. And Jesus is going, this is exactly what I want, you know. Because he's like, the frustration level had to be just astronomical. So finally, he gets him on the cross, gets him killed, you know, <laughs> and he still fails. He's in the lake of fire suffering, knowing that his entire life is fail, but he will not repent because there is no regeneration in the lake. There is just the continuous... Um, punishment for sins unforgiven and undealt with. And there's no I'm sorry going on in the lake relative to repentance. There is, oh God, oh God, oh God. Okay. He says, in the name of our Lord Jesus, the authority of that name, you do this. Second step, when you are assembled together. When you are together, when you are assembled. Now, why does, he, why does he do that? Why can't we just do this in private? Why can't we do this in private? Why can't this sin that we're reading about just be handled in the pastor's office or something? Exactly. Bingo, bango, wango. It's a public sin. Everybody knew about it. So the congregation has got to speak to it. Now, here's, here's, why does he say in the assembly? Because, just, gee, Paul is following... Christ's teaching on this subject, Matthew 18, might as well look at it, Matthew 18, look at verse 15, look how a private sin, as Jesus lays it out, suddenly can become a public one and must be dealt with by the assembly. Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. 
If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Great. It's, it's taken care of. Two. But if he doesn't listen to you, take one or two more with you, that, and then he quotes Deuteronomy 17 and 19, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Step three, still haven't won your brother. He still hasn't been convinced. Oh, no, see, this is, all, this is all about the sins of unforgiveness is what this is. 17, if he refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church. See, one of the reasons you get witnesses to go with you the second time is you're prepping them for trial. You're, you're, you're lining up your witnesses so that if step three is necessary to take it before the church, you'll have your two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, the ecclesia, the assembly. If he refuses to listen to the church, now this is a, a case where, you know, the court has taken, you become the court. It's the court. See, in Presbyterian, biblical Presbyterian polity, we call this the court. When the membership assembles to make a decision on a serious, dire matter like this, like we're dealing with right here, you then are the court, you see. And the individual, in this case, who is sinning and unrepentant, has to be here. And if they're not here, then they are guilty by default. They're saying no, no, no contest. Hello? See, that's why some years ago when Sam Frost was moving into horrible doctrinal deviation and this church had taken the responsibility back in 2002, I think it was, 2000, 2002, to ordain him, um, we then had a responsibility to deal with that. The church had a responsibility to deal with that. We were the sending agency for that ordination. See, And so once he had been talked to by me on several occasions uh, and who refused admonition in regards to some of these errors, then it had to become, you know, a church scenario. So we had to list uh, the charges against him and get that in writing and get that off uh, to him. And then we set a court date and demanded that he come and face these charges. He's in Florida, you know. Well, he just laughed that off. The arrogance was terrible. Now, he's not that way anymore. He has since repented. Um, it would be good if he would make things right with his congregation. I think that's still uh, something that needs to be done. But that's my opinion on the matter. But in any case, um, you know, we had, we had court. Um, he wasn't here. So we tried him based on the facts as we knew it. We wanted him to come and give a defense and, and an answer to these charges that we had put together based on his own writings and his own teachings that were contrary to Scripture, as we understand Scripture. He, do, he wouldn't come. He wouldn't show. So we had to try him in absentia. Not the best way to go. But when you don't do that, you're not disputing the charges. Then what are you saying? No contest. What? We're supposed to say, we're supposed to believe that, that these charges aren't true, but he, he takes no step. To show that the charges aren't true? Really? That's how you think? Go work for the Obama administration. There's a place for you. So what we got here in 1817, if he refuses to listen to them, the witnesses, tell it to the church. So then the church rebukes him. If he refuses to listen to the church, then what do you got here? He says, let him be unto you as a Gentile and a tax collector. You know what he said that? The Gentiles, he's speaking to a Jewish audience, the Gentiles were considered outside of the Abrahamic covenant. A tax collector was a Jew who collected taxes by padding the taxes and stuck, sticking the rest in his pocket big time. So either they were the most richest people, and richest Jews, you know, in that entire area of Palestine, and they were hated by the Jewish people. Well, yeah! What do you think of the tax guy? <laughs> you know, the IRS and this kind of a thing. Just as bad. And it's not quite maybe on a personal level, although it will become personal pretty soon here in a couple of months. See what we're saying? So you look back at 1 Corinthians 5, and he says, verse 4, when you are assembled, that's the second step, so you, you as the voting membership are involved. Step 3, and I with you in spirit, or uh, my spirit uh, is with you, might be a better way of, of I think, translating that. Step 4, 
And we've already discussed that. Step four, with the power of our Lord Jesus. Now notice there's a difference here between the top of verse one and the bottom of uh, top of verse four and the bottom of verse four. When the top of verse four says, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that's the authority by which this action is taken. When the bottom of verse four says, with the power of our Lord Jesus, that's dunamai, that is the actual power to carry this thing out. Not just authority to address it, but now power to carry it out. So once you've done these four things, verse 5 kicks in. If you have a New American Standard says, I have decided <laughs> to follow Jesus. Just slash those words out. I think they get in the way. They're italicized. They, the translators put them in there. I'd have fought against that too. What else is new? With the power of our Lord Jesus moves right into this. To deliver such a one to Satan. Why? For the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus to deliver such a one over to Satan. Um, not the only time this has happened. Paul had to do it to apparently two fellows uh, that were uh, either elders, well, probably elders in the church that got off into some pretty serious error. And you can find Paul talking about that in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 20. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 20. He says, Hymenaeus and Alexandra, or Alexander, I have delivered over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. So evidently, um, all the rebuking, there's no, as far as we know, there was no church involved. Mm, Paul is exercising the apostolic authority over these two guys. That's why I think they were they were presbyters. I think they were elders. And uh they were into some form of blasphemy. Maybe they th had it all, you know, had a nice little theological bow put on their blasphemy and everything and made it look, you know, like Jehovah's Witness or Mormons, you know, nice coat of varnish paint and everything is nice and luminescent and shining and, oh, you know, unicorns and rainbows, you know, but inside, you know, it's putrefying flesh, you know, on a hot griddle. Just let that sink in for a moment. I can smell that. And Paul says, I have handed them over to Satan so that they'll learn not to blaspheme. Now, when he says in verse 5, to deliver such a one to Satan, is Paul saying, you are to say that to, to, to this person. You are now handed over to Satan for the destruction of your flesh. And does the devil then appear and whisk this guy away and suddenly he's gone? No. Um, I take the position, which is the standard position of the culture of that time, that this is another means of saying uh, that this person is being excommunicated out of the protection and the ark of the church into the domain of the devil. This doesn't mean that that he is the God of this world. He certainly is not. And that passage in 2 Corinthians should not be in chapter 4 should not be understood that way. Um, but that's another subject for another time. When he says, he says, deliver this one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, it means, look, look what does verse 13 say? What does verse 13 say? Second half. Everybody say it. So remove the wicked man from among you. That's your interpretive grid. It's the Bible interpreting the Bible. Remove him from among you. What does it mean to, to hand him over to Satan? It means to put him under his control and under his power. When you cast him out of the protection of the womb of the church, when you cast him out from that, then he comes under, this man would, this, this fornicator, come, comes under the control of the world, which is under the control of the devil. For a, for a specific thing, so that, his, so that his flesh might be going under destruction. Verse 5, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction, the olethros, could also mean ruination, for the ruination of his flesh. Now, flesh here doesn't mean sin nature. Uh, you, <laughs> Satan's not about to assist with that. He wants that thing to go on and be nice and healthy. No, this is, uh, this is tantamount to body right here. This is one of those cases where Paul's talking about the effect that it has on somebody physically. So this could mean, you know, uh, 
coming down with some sort of horrendous disease, who knows what, but the body would be affected so that it would drive this young man to repentance. Now you know Paul, he's going to have to speak to this scenario already taking place among some of the people in the church here in chapter 11 when it comes to the abuse of the Lord's table. Some of you are sick and some of you are dead. The ones who are dead, I don't know what happened to them. Don't ask me, I, you, do you think they were safe? I have no idea, I don't know. You know, there's false professors in any church. I've already pointed out to you the first chapter. Paul believes that in the main, he's talking to Christians right here. Maybe there was a, an olethros, a ruination, that resulted in physical death. Maybe. Was the guy saved? How do I know what their eternal destiny is? You're asking me a question like that? How would I know? Right? So let's not ask that question. Let's just understand that, okay, are they coming under the biblical criteria of is this sin in their life? Yep, that's sin in their life according to Scripture. And is, is, is this type of uh, punitive punishment, you know, this temporal punishment, is this a part of Scripture too to get even a Christian to repent if they have backslidden that far? That Yep, sure what? Read Hebrews the 12th chapter. That's just one passage. Okay? This is certainly another. Well, then, yeah, I mean, you know, the guy, he doesn't repent, he doesn't repent, he doesn't repent, or he acts like, the, I don't know what's wrong, and it never comes out, and he dies. You know, is the person saved? Why do you have to have that satisfied in your mind? Maybe I should put it this way, because I don't think you're asking me, you here are not asking me that, but why do we always feel like we have to have that question satisfied? You know, you know why? Because we're nudges. We're just, we're just wanting into everybody's business. We even want into God's business. How do I know? I don't know. All I know is that the person died in a state where there was like no change, no repentance. On the other hand, sometimes there is, you know, and there's, there's healing. It brings them back to health. And that doesn't mean that every person, every Christian that has died of some disease is because of they're in some unrepented thing. I'm not saying that. But sometimes it is that, that way. But there has to be information that goes before that verifies that. He says that this is for, this delivering over to Satan <clears throat> is for the destruction of his flesh. Ooh, look at chapter 6, verse 18. 6.18. He says, flee... Porneos, there's that word immorality again. Flee fornication. Why, Paul? Well, every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. Think about that for a second. All the other sins that men commit are outside the body. What does he mean by that? Look at the rest of 18. But the porneos man, the fornicating man, sins against his own body. This is the only sin in Scripture that specifically says that it will have a direct effect on your physical state. If you are a porneos man or woman, it will have a direct effect on your physical state. Wow. So when he says then that here in chapter 5, verse 5, delivering over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh or his body, that's directly connected to this porneos, isn't it? And is that all there is to it? God's just going to get his pound of flesh? Going to make that guy suffer? Is that, is that the point? Not the point, is it? He says, so that, so that, his spirit, that's your saved self, his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, there's some question in Paul's mind as to whether or not this person is truly regenerate when he's carrying on in, you know, in a fornicating situation. That, that's the question. Is he truly regenerate? Well, Paul doesn't know, but Paul knows that this sin has to be stopped, and the guy's unrepentant. He may not be regenerate because he's unrepentant about that, even in the face of the church and in the face of Paul the Apostle having to step in and publicly deal with this guy. Wow. See? So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, because the day of the Lord Jesus is the parousia. That's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord Jesus, that's the day of reckoning. That's when all accounts are settled. See, that's why you are saved because Jesus returned and judgments and accounting and reckoning was taken, had taken place. That's part of the salvation program. That's Hebrews 9.28. He will, he will appear the second time not to deal with sin, but to bring what? Bingo, baby. 
salvation. Exacto mundo. That's the day of the Lord. I was going to take you into passages that demonstrate that, but we're not going to do that now. How do we uh, begin to wind this down now and wind all this together? It's a lot of stuff in just a few verses right here. Dealing with unrepentant sin of the congregation. I think we conclude it this way. Just follow your outline for a second. This is a good conclusion. It's a good, good three-point outline. Good conclusion. First of all, when you deal with sins, whether it's personal, one-on-one, -on -one, or whether you have to be in a, a public situation in a membership meeting where somebody has, has brought themselves to this point, you know, and they have to be judged in the congregation. <coughs> First of all, you have to deal with the facts. You've got to get the facts out there. There has to be witnesses. And this is Paul, what Paul is doing. Never make a judgment or even begin to make a judgment or think you can make a judgment if you don't have all of the facts. I think facts are critical. Um, James and I were on the phone yesterday and we were talking about uh, the textual criticism. You know, And my favorite word in all of that is facts. Facts. You know. Uh, just the facts, ma'am. I am the Sergeant Friday of the manuscript transmission world. Just the facts, ma'am. I don't want to hear about your, your emotional thing, your attachment to the King James Bible. Yes, I love the King James Bible, too. Here, wait. Here. Give me my King James Bible. Who's got one? Kathy's got one. We love it. We love it. There. Okay, good. Right. All right, love that. Uh, but this is the facts. Then I got to fix it. Greek New Testament first. Okay. Get the facts down. Secondly, we got to deal with sin by making a judgment. Paul steps forward and it says, I've already judged this man who, who has done this. Once he had the facts and he knew what the man's behavior was up against what the scripture declared that to be, he was able to make a judgment. And you're able to do the exact same thing. It just makes us uncomfortable. Now, by doing this, I'm not... But have you noticed I have not told one of you to go out individually and start pointing the finger at somebody? Okay, no. This is something that is done in the congregation. If you have a scenario where you, you're with a friend or something like that, and you know, and you, you know that there's some sin going on, and you start to counsel them from the word about it, you know, you gotta, you're offended. You are, because you know it's active, and it's going on in their lives. Man, that is... The, the amount of Christians out there that are in sin, they call themselves Christians anyway, they just offend me. And I've tried going to them about this stuff. We're not in the same congregation, so it doesn't reach the number three step in the Matthew 18, 15 through 18 scenario. But it's very grieving. I've told you about the, you know, just when Carrie and I first got back here to town, and some folks who used to attend this church, um, and don't anymore, um, sat down with us and everything, and she made some comments here, and it was obvious sin in, in her life. And I just grieved. I went, what? You know, and are you kidding me? It had to do with, you know, unforgiveness towards somebody. This person had no intention of ever forgiving this other person. And I was just, I was just calmly beside myself kind of a thing. Um, they don't go here anymore, you know. And just seeing them, I was taken back. Um, haven't seen her talk to them since, and... You know, that's where it is, you know. It's, it's just very wrong. Um, sometimes people are going to react well to you. They'll say, they might even say afterwards, they might even say thank you to you. Thanks for pointing that stuff out. Nobody else, you know, has had the chutzpah to do that, you know. Have some. Have some biblical boldness in regards to that. So there's going to be a point where you're going to have to make a judgment after you've assembled the facts. Finally, dealing with sin involves the congregation. We do this together. We do this by the book, and we do this together. When a scenario reaches that point, but i got to tell you, I have never experienced a Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18 scenario ever get to the point of going to the congregation, going to the court. You know why? They'll run before that. They'll just run before that. You know? Even if they're members, and they're already, if they're already into that sin and it's ongoing, you can bet if they're willing to let it be ongoing in their life, even after it becomes public, they're, nine times out of ten, are not willing. If they're willing to stay in sin, they're also equally willing to sin by not submitting to the congregation in a court membership scenario. Follow what I'm saying? I've never seen it get to that point. But 
I think I, I believe it has gotten to that point in some situations. I just never have, have seen it myself. So there are these things that we have to deal with. Now, this is just part two of dealing with unrepentant sin in the congregation. This is how Paul says this is to be going down. Remember, as yucky as this is about what this guy and this gal are doing, it pales in comparison to the lack of steps that the church should have taken and didn't take. This is the issue that's going on right here. So let me, uh, let me close this down with a word of prayer and a little assistance here. Father, in Jesus' name, we, we just ask, Lord, that you would uh, hide these things inside of us, Lord God, as true instruction. That we watch our own lives, Lord God, in accordance with your word. That we do not let anything even sneak in the crack of the back door of our personal lives that could turn into something as heinous and as public as this. And Lord, let us also not think that we can keep uh, pr ongoing sins private. Help us to know, Lord, that like your word says, you are faithful to expose that darkness to the light. And our sins will find us out. Let us walk in the light as you are in the light. And Lord, if we need a little help, let's go to a brother or a sister, somebody we love and trust in the congregation, maybe one of the elders, and let's just get some help. There's no condemnation in that. Nobody's going to out them. It's going to be staying private. Well, that's a good thing, Lord, when somebody says, I'm caught up in this and I need help because I know it's sin. I want to please the Lord. I want to be the bride of Christ that he has washed on Calvary's tree. Yeah. And if you're in that situation, by the way, and uh, you need a little bit of help, you make sure you let me or Keith or Tony know. Or it can be one of the brothers. You know, by the way, it should be brother with a brother, sister with a sister. Don't cross the sexes, please. Um, go to another member of the church, somebody who, who they love you, and you can trust them. Remember Romans 15, 14. He says, I'm confident that you are able to admonish one another. And that's what we have going on right here. Don't let that thing continue to go on and, and infiltrate and take hold of your life. So, Father, we just trust that you will, you will continue to uh, finish the work that you have begun in us, Lord. He who has begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for that. Praise you for your faithfulness and may your strong hand be upon your people now throughout the rest of today. And as they've received the word, even though it's been a tough, tough word today, Lord God, uh, let us not, uh, let us not dry eraser board it away from our minds. And Lord, and as we give and worship you with our gifts, Lord, for the ministry uh, of Messiah Reform Church. May your people be blessed back a hundred times as much, I pray. Lord, uh, cause them to sow abundantly as they are able to, and so then reap abundantly. Thank you, Lord, for that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, 